Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is June 16th, 2022. This is part four of my series called Born of Water. I changed the uh, numbering because I included what is the oil of the five wise virgins in this series, and that is part one. So uh, today is part four of the series Born of Water. The title comes from the teaching of Jesus to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 <clears throat> and says that we cannot enter the kingdom of God unless we are born of water and the Spirit. It's imperative that we are born of water now. Too many Christians have failed to <clears throat> fill themselves with the water of God and therefore they do not have oil and are not ready for the coming of our Lord, which is imminent. Let's start today with Revelation chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Jesus, of course, is the Amen. And when he spoke to people uh, in the book of John, we hear him saying over and over again, Amen, Amen, which is translated as truly, truly. And it means truth. So Jesus says to the church of Laodicea, the Church of Laodicea is the last of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. I believe it, it speaks specifically of this church at the end of the age. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. The word is actually vomit. I will vomit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Church, do you understand? That's your condition. Wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and buy from me salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Isn't that interesting? Here's three things Jesus is telling the church to buy from him. Gold, refined by fire, white garments, and salve. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. This is communion. Communion means, here again, the church see, is, is all wrong about communion. They make it into some religious event that you do either weekly or monthly or whenever they decide to do it and don't even realize what it's all about. Communion is all about eating Christ. It's all about eating the Word of God, filling ourselves with the Word of God. To the one who overcomes, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. You know, this is amazing. Look at the promise here. What does it take to sit down with someone on their throne? A throne is a seat, right? You don't have thrones for two people. Jesus sat down with his father on his throne. That's because they're one. We sit down with 
Jesus on his throne. That's the promise to the overcomer. How is that? Because we become one with him. How do we become one? By communing with him, by eating his body and drinking his blood spiritually. So going back here in Revelation, when it talks about buying gold, what is that gold? Isn't that interesting? So Isaiah 55, verse 1, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good. Listen to my words. Eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. My words are rich food. And now we have, in Revelation chapter 3, not only is his word the waters in um, Isaiah 55, his word are waters, wine, milk, bread, rich food, and now in Revelation chapter 3, gold. His waters become gold. His waters become white garments that we clothe ourselves in so that the shame of our nakedness is not seen. And his waters become salve to anoint our blind eyes so that we may see. So here now we have three more words that are all representing the Word of God. We need to wash ourselves with the Word, as Ephesians chapter 5 says. And the promise is great. The promise is actually to become a co-ruler with Christ and to actually sit upon his throne. So now let's continue with John chapter 7 because in John we see this progression even now continuing. We've seen it now in every chapter of the book of John. Now we're going to today look at John chapter 7, chapter 8, and chapter 9 and we're going to see this theme continuing and it's really, it's just, it's so profound. So in John chapter 7, it begins like this. After this, That means after what happened in John chapter 6, which was talking about Jesus saying he was the bread of life and that you had to eat his flesh and drink his blood. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. This is the feast of tabernacles in the seventh month of the Jewish year. And this is how I knew when I read John chapter 6. The beginning of chapter 6 says this. Verse 4, now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. And I said that was not the Passover during which Jesus was crucified. Well, this is how we know, because chapter 7 begins with the Feast of Booths, which was seven months after the feast of, this feast of Passover in John chapter 6. And I'm, I'm taking time to share this with you so that When you read the Word of God, you make distinctions in what you read, and you don't just come to conclusions based upon what somebody else said or what you just seem to think. Look at the Word of God because it's it's written with a purpose in mind. It is factually correct, and it always speaks prophetic truth. So, In John chapter 7, we're now at the time of the Feast of Booths. Verse 14, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? You don't need to go to a Bible college. You don't need to go to a seminary. You don't need to be ordained by a certain group of people in order to teach the Word of God. You need to be filled with the Word of God yourself. That's your qualification. To hear from God yourself is the qualification. 
So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking, speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. This is still true today. My teaching is not mine, but it's the teaching of the one who sent me. Who sent me? God sent me, just as God sent Jesus. How do you know the true teacher from the false teacher? Because the false teacher tries to make a name for himself, and he has his own ministry, his own books, such and such commentaries on this, this, and this, the such and such Bible, you know, and just fill in the blank. You know people who have done this. So it's their word. It's their ministry. They've made a name for themselves and become very rich doing it as well. So what's the motivation? First of all, the motivation of teaching the word of God should never ever be to become wealthy or rich. but only to glorify the one who sent you. And then Jesus gives you a critical teaching for how to know who is the true teacher and who is the false teacher. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. I say the same thing. If your will is to know the will of God and to do the will of God, then you will know whether my teaching is true or not. And you'll know whether or not anyone else's teaching is true or not. This is how you know. This is how you can discern. If you desire to do God's will, if you desire to know his truth and not man's truth, then you will know whether the teaching of any particular person is true or not. Jesus very clearly told the Pharisees this. He, he kept telling them how they could know who he was. But see, they were arrogant. They were full of pride because they were the teachers. They were the teachers. You know. And so their pride kept them from hearing the truth. Verse 18, the one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? See, it was a violation of God's law for them to kill Christ. And of course they deny it. The crowd answered, you have a demon. Who's seeking to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one work and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision. Not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. So Jesus is talking about doing a healing on the Sabbath that really incensed them. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me? Because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is, speaking openly. And they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from. And when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, You know me, and you know where I come from. But I have not come by my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done?
Then going down a couple verses to verse 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, this is probably the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. The Scripture, as the Scripture says, now we looked at one last time from Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3, it says, With joy you will draw water from the wells of Yeshua. Isaiah translated the English Standard Version as salvation, but his name, Jesus' name, Yeshua, means salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of Yeshua. So we draw waters from Jesus. Another reference to this, which is very interesting. This reference is in the uh, English Standard Version. And again, I encourage you to, to get that version and the references are really outstanding because it will help you to understand the scripture many times. And one of the scriptures it takes you to is that scripture from Isaiah 12. Another one is um, from Ezekiel chapter 47, verses one through 12. And I wanna read these verses to you. Now starting in Ezekiel 40, God gives Ezekiel a vision of a future temple. Many people interpret that as being a physical temple that they say is going to be rebuilt over in the Middle East and ancient Jerusalem. It's not. It's a, it's a spiritual temple and we see that very clearly here in chapter 47. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. Then he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me round on the outside to the outer gate that faces toward the east, and behold, water was trickling out on the south side. Going on eastward with a measuring line in his hand, the man measured a thousand cubits. Each cubit here is, um, in, the, in the book of Ezekiel, I believe is 21 inches longer than the standard cubit because he used a long cubit. And then the man led me through the water and it was ankle deep. So here we are almost 2,000 feet beyond the, the, um, the door, the threshold of the temple. And the water is getting deeper. It's ankle deep now. Again, he measured 1,000. So now we're over 3,000 feet out from the temple. It led me through the water and it was knee deep. And again, he, me he measured 1,000 cubits and led me through the water and it was waist deep. Again, he measured a thousand, so now we're over a mile away from the temple. And it was a river that I could not pass through. For the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in, a river that could not be passed through. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? What is this? How, how does this little trickle of water from the temple become a river of water? Did he pass other springs? No. Then he led me back to the bank of the river. As I went, I saw on the bank of the river many, very many trees on the one side and on the other. And he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah and enters the sea. When the water flows into the sea, the water will become fresh. 
So the sea will become fresh, is what it means here. The water is fresh. It enters the sea. What's the sea? And wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live, and there will be very many fish. What are the fish? For this water goes there, that the waters of the sea may become fresh, so everything will live where the river goes. Fishermen will stand beside the sea, from Engedi to Enaglame. It will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be of very many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. But its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They are to be left for salt. And on the banks, on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month, because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. Obviously, we're looking at spiritual things. This is a spiritual temple. What is this temple? Let's go to Revelation chapter 21. <clears throat> Verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Who's seated on the throne? <clears throat> Remember, Jesus is seated with his Father on the throne. We see that in Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 21, 6. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. This is Jesus speaking here. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who overcomes will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. That's the salt area, by the way, outside of this river of life that we see in Ezekiel 47. So in Ezekiel 47, what you're seeing is the river of life. In Revelation 21, Jesus says, To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Here's that phrase again, without payment. See, it's not about money. You know, that's one of the things, all, all the people producing videos these days, they always, always have the ads. Give me money, give me money, give me money for what I'm teaching you. Give me money, give me money. Without payment, I will give you water without payment, Jesus says. And like Jesus, I say the same thing. I will give you water without payment. Now, in Revelation 22, it starts like this. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So here again, you have, the, you have God and the Lamb on the throne. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. 
No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Now go back to Ezekiel 47. So we see this trickle of water coming out of the temple, which becomes deeper and deeper until it becomes a river. So it's the river of the water of life. And look at verse 7. As I went back, I saw, saw on the bank of the river very many trees on the one side and on the other. And then verse 12. And on the banks on both sides of the river there will grow all kinds of trees for food. What's this food? Of course it's the word of God. Their leaves will not wither nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month. The word of God is always fresh because the water for them flows from the sanctuary, flows directly from God. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. So then back to Revelation 22, verse 2, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Revelation 21 describes New Jerusalem. Let's, let's go ahead and look at this because we need to know this. Verse 9, 21, 9. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, Come, I will show you the, show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Now remember... <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5. Twenty-five. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Christ cleanses the church by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish, that she might be arrayed in fine linen, white linen. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Christ and the church become one. Those who wash themselves with the water of the word So chapter 21, verse 9, one of the seven angels comes, says, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. This is the wife, this is the bride who made herself ready, who washed herself with the word, so that she could become one with Christ. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain, and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Okay, so the angel says, come, I'll show you the bride. And then he shows him the holy city, Jerusalem. What's that tell you? It tells you that the bride becomes the city, coming down out of heaven from God, 
having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels. And on the gates the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the, three, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. Isn't that interesting? That sounds like Ezekiel 47, doesn't it? Where the angel measures everything with a rod. He measures everything in cubits. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia, its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits. Here's that number 144, it comes up over and over. If you take the length times the width, 12,000 stadia times 12,000 stadia, that's 144 million square stadia. So there's the 144 again. You have 144,000 mentioned for the number of the overcomers twice in the book of Revelation, and now we have this 144 million and 144 cubits. The wall was built of jasper while the city was of pure gold, like clear glass. Mm. The cities of pure gold. Go back to Revelation 3, verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire. We buy gold. We become gold. See, that's the point. We become gold. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. Remember, Peter says we're, we're being built up with living stones. We are these stones. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophrase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. And its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day. And there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Here we have no enduring city. This is our city. We literally become that city. This moves then to Revelation 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. So here you have the water that's flowing out of the city. And on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So this is what we see in Revelation 21 and 22 is exactly what Ezekiel saw in Revelation 47. So the temple is never going to be rebuilt over in Jerusalem, at least not God's temple. Man might build another temple, but it's not going to fulfill anything. God will never come there and, and dwell there. That just won't happen. Because the temple described in Ezekiel is New Jerusalem described in Revelation 21 and 22. And the, the reality is 
we become that temple. That's how important it is to be born of water. See, we cannot enter the kingdom of God unless we're born of water. The kingdom of God is this city. The kingdom of God is New Jerusalem. That's what we're called to. That's how great this calling is. So now we go back to the book of John. We were reading in John chapter 7, verse 38. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Whoever believes in Jesus, that person out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Do waters come forth out of you? The only way that waters can come forth out of you is first, if you're born of the Spirit, and second, if you're born of water. So we receive the Holy Spirit by faith when we believe in Jesus, when we truly believe, and then if we truly believe, we will eat his word. We will consume his word. It will be life to us. It will be so important to us that we will want it every day. Every day. That's why the manna came every day. We need to feed upon the word of God every day. And it needs to be that we feed ourselves. We don't let someone else spoon feed us all the time and simply take what they have for us. We need to learn, we need to be weaned from the breast as we learn in Isaiah 28. We need to learn line upon line, precept upon precept. But it's because people refuse to do that that they stumble and that they never get on with God and that they remain children forever. And they continue to eat bad food. They continue to eat the vomit that the false prophets and the false pastors and the false teachers serve them constantly. That's the beginning of Isaiah 28. Remember, Jesus wore a seamless garment. It represents, it represented the word of God that's seamless. That's why you hear me go here and go there and go there and then pull it back together because it's a seamless garment. But you can never understand it until you begin to feed on it daily. And then suddenly the lights will go on. When you read the Bible, always pray, Father, give me ears to hear. Give me spiritual ears to hear. Father, give me spiritual eyes to see so that I can understand your word. I cannot understand God's word in the natural. I cannot understand his words by my own fleshly thinking. They are spiritual words, and only the spiritual man can comprehend them. I thought we would get on beyond chapter 7 today, but I think this is a good place to end this one. Take these words, study them, 
And remember to put them, put John 7 with Ezekiel 47 and with Revelation 21 and 22. And be sure to read Revelation 3 with respect to the church of Laodicea. Amen.